On today's show, the three members of Wallows, we get into everything from how they met through their mothers on an online chat to the new record to everything in between. I think you're going to really enjoy this conversation. The boys in Wallows coming up next. Welcome into the show, Wallows. How are you guys? We're good. Great how to see you. Thanks good. for having Rainy us. New York, you brought the rain from L.A. We really did, huh? <laughs> yeah, cats and dogs for some reason yeah. right now. Yeah, it's crazy. We were just in London and it wasn't even raining there. I'm a little bit jealous. I have to tell you, like, you, you seem like you're truly best friends, which I, I've been in bands for many years and we're never like best friends. But you guys, I feel like you're having such a great time and you really have that kinship, which is amazing. I mean, is it true that you really, like, do you hang out with each other when you're not on the road? Yeah, I'd yeah, say totally. So. Yeah, totally. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you're like, not really. Uh, um, no, uh, we do. I mean, I think also uh, the guys that we play with, like, because there's three of us, but like the, the three other guys that play with us too are also, we see them all the time at home. They're like, we're all, yeah, best friends. Because yeah. people don't realize, like, when you're on tour, it's like you're living in these shoe boxes, the bunks. Do you have a tour bus? I guess you, right? You yeah, fly. Tour bus, and, yeah. And it's really close quarters. So sometimes you get along famously, and sometimes there's a crazy <laughs> dynamic. But it's amazing that you guys are incredible friends. Take, take me back to the beginning of your story, because you're from LA, but really you grew up in Indiana. I did grow up in Indiana. Brain grew up in Ohio. Yeah, so. I did. I and Cole's born and raised LA. I'm Van Nuys, yeah. right? San Fernando Valley, yeah. yes. Van Nuys. Van Nuys. Yes. yes. Yeah, so talk, talk to me how about, I think your mom's first met online, which is a crazy story, because my mom introduced me to guys my band early on. I was like, really, mom? You're going to introduce me to, like, the guys my band when I'm a kid? But tell me how you, you all met. Yeah, I mean, uh, so Dylan and I both moved from the Midwest to California when we were, like, 9, 10 years old. And for some reason, by chance, our moms met on an online chat room for, like, moms who were bringing their kids to LA to act and just wanted to meet someone. And somehow they met and Dylan went to my place uh, when we were like nine years old. And we, we just met at a Cheesecake out. Factory. For well, the first we, time. We, yeah, we officially met at a Cheesecake Factory. We and we were like, we just bonded immediately. Yeah. And um, <laughs> we just started hanging out every day. It was like a, an interesting thing. Apparently you wrote a paper about me or you, you, like <laughs> he like wrote some sort of like, what was I'm that? obsessed with Braden. No, um, <laughs> I, well, no, I, I was like, I was going out to LA for acting for my first time when I was eight and I was really excited. And my mom and I were maybe going to stay with your family. Mm -hmm. um, All online. It sounds sketchy, but it wasn't sketchy. No, it wasn't sketchy, but <laughs> right. we we're maybe going to like live with them for a few months. But then, um, so I was, I remember I was so excited because I knew that you and your brother had like a bunch of gaming systems. Mm -hmm. So I, was, I remember like writing, I don't know what the, what the purpose of it was, but for the class, we had to write something. And I was telling the class how I was like, what was I, whatever grade I was, second grade, first grade, second grade. And I was super excited because um, they had like a GameCube and a PlayStation and an Xbox. And <laughs> I, I would remember telling the class, I was like, they have all these things. And I was so excited. Wow. And then um, we didn't end up staying with them though. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was bummed. Yeah, but then we just started hanging out all the time, and then we bonded over our love for music at a very young age. And early on, it was the Beatles, it was Zeppelin. What were you listening to early on? Because it's, I mean, you were writing songs at such an early age, which is rare, right? Most people don't write songs at like ten or eleven. Mm. Right. I mean, it, the Beatles was probably the the first one that uh, made me realize that you could just like write your own songs. Like it's kind of funny, but like you just that's one of the blueprints for the Beatles is that they wrote the majority of their music. So my dad was also in bands and so was Dylan's dad who, and they wrote songs. So I think it was just natural from day one that I was like, oh, music is just something you do. And um, then we kind of moved on to, you know, the Strokes and <laughs> right. Arctic Monkeys and all that, but yeah. And Cole, did you share a love of like Zeppelin and the Beatles or was it some of the other stuff like the Strokes that you got into early on? Um, I definitely liked the same sort of I guess you'd say that it's classic rock, right? Um, but my introduction to it, I think, was just the video games, Guitar Hero and Rock Band. That was kind of like my foray into like that maybe more like, I guess, mature music for a kid. Um, so yeah, I think at that, at that time, we all kind of bonded over that for mm -hmm. sure, I think, when we met. When you think about those first songs you wrote, did you ever go back and listen to them? Is there maybe gonna be like a surprise? Was it gonna end up in a set at some point or not really? <laughs> 
We actually kind of did that. Did you? We did. Um, <laughs> yes. Margarita like taco. Is that oh, like one of the... Oh, yeah, wow. Yeah, that's, <laughs> you know. And that end up in the set at any point? Uh, not that one. Not that one. <laughs> uh, that's the first song Brandon and I ever wrote together. Um, yeah. Mirror 11. Uh, no, we did like... Um, we did this... The Roxy in L.A. Um, had like their 50th anniversary last year, and they asked us to participate in it by like doing a special show. And we have a lot of history there. We played there as... 13 year olds and the first wallow show was there as well and um you know just a lot of history that we had done a lot there at the roxy but um because of that we're like how do we make this show special because we've already done like an underplay here before we've already done like a special show uh and we we're like well we made the set crazy but then the encore we should like we should play because our first band was called the fever right and we're like we should play a couple fever songs and we played more than a couple <laughs> we played a ton. well we only we only planned one it was just the three of us on stage and uh we played one of our old songs. And then um, I decided it'd be fun to take a couple shots before doing the encore. And we ended up having like a 45 minute encore <laughs> of- uh, Only Fever songs. A bunch of Fever songs. Yes. And then like a few new, a few more Wallow songs. And um, <laughs> right afterwards, I was like, that was, pro- yeah. that was crazy. In yeah. the moment, that was so much fun though, because yeah. I can so vividly remember the feeling of being on stage as the fever when yeah. we were teenagers yeah. and then like the curtain going up, you know, and yeah. being like, damn, there's like 40 people in the, you know, yeah, like, like just crazy. people we know. And then like to, to then have like the transition to now, it's like, it's, it's just, it's just insane. It's so you all met and you started playing at an early age and then eventually you met Cole, but how did y'all meet? How did you guys come to connect later on in LA? Cole, how do we meet you? <laughs> well, um, in the the San Fernando Valley where um, I grew up, there's this music program called Join the Band, All which right. um, this dude basically it's like a bunch of kids sign up and then they organize you into groups and then you it's a school of rock right. type thing um, and you play covers at a venue in LA um, and so I was just, I was just paired in their group mm-hmm. so it, like you guys signed up as a unit yes and then I was the drummer assigned like we just were put in the same band. Um, Were you doing Zeppelin covers at 13? Because Zeppelin is really hard to play for people that don't know. Because <laughs> I feel like mm. I can barely play Zeppelin now, and I'm way over that age. So were you doing – was it that age that you were actually attempting to do, like, Zeppelin covers? I mean, sort of. We um, – we, when we – there's this venue uh, called the Cat Club, oh, which, sure. yeah, yeah, it's now um, – like an Irish pub or something yeah. called like O'Reilly. It's like it's it's gone. Yeah. It's not known as Cat Club anymore. But um, we we almost had like a residency there. I would say like yeah. we played there like weekly or like twice a month. <laughs> Fever residency. Yeah, yeah. But uh, we would play Moby Dick, and there was Amazing. this whole bit where like you guys would like go on the floor and like there'd be like a drum <laughs> yes. solo and stuff. We also we we also did the Rover. We yes. Did, didn't we, we did do the Over Rover. the Hills and Far Away. Over the Hills and Far Away. Rock and roll. We did rock and roll. Oh yeah. Yeah. The first, the, oh, what? No, 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 go, go. Um, the first, <laughs> the first set list we ever did though at that join the band thing was um, Purple Haze. Yep. The first song we ever ever played together. Yeah. And then we did Under the Bridge and Jailbreak. That was the first kind of hard songs. songs. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Brain just shredding on yeah. Under I mean, the like, Bridge intro. Yeah. Genuinely, like I would say, good songs. Yeah. yeah, you know, like that Thin Lizzy song is not. Uh, that's like a really cool song. It so is. you're doing like a residency at 13 and playing twice a week, or was it at, at that point? Was it were you guys a little bit older? It was oh. at least like once a month at Cat Club. At least did yeah. you have to like hide in the basement because you didn't have an ID? Like, because you're not allowed to be in the clubs really at that age, right? Or was it like a daytime thing? What were like? No, the, it was a nighttime thing. No. I don't know how it happened. Yeah. I don't know why. Yeah, that one specifically, we didn't have to like go through any loopholes or hoops at all. <laughs> There was a place called Howl at the Moon at City Walk that we needed to like play and then leave immediately. Right. They had yeah. to put X's on Playing us, with X's on our hands. Yeah. Yeah. Classic. Wow. Classic. You end up meeting Craig Common later, right? right? Talk to me oh, about Craig. how you met Craig and the folks at Atlantic and working up to that point for you. I don't know. Hmm. Well, I remember the first person who reached out to us after we put out our first song, Pleaser, was this wonderful man named Austin Rice. And uh, he is an A&R man at Atlantic. And we met with him and he just wanted us to fly to New York to, to meet Craig and the people at Atlantic. And we met with Craig and he's such a smart music minded person. Like he's, he's actually like the, the music knowledge that he has is in, insane. And he has like a million record collection and all these things. Like he was just really cool, really chill, always has like really nice, insightful things to say. 
Um, but yeah, he was, that's how we met. We just flew to New York or he was in LA. He, he was in LA. We met him in LA. Yeah, we met him in LA actually. He, he was there. Did but, you have the showcase for Atlantic at that point? Had Austin like seen you play? That's a good question. Gosh. There's no showcase. No showcase. No. No. I think um, I'm trying to like go back to that time, but I, I remember, yeah, he was the first meeting we ever took mm -hmm. just to the like whatever it was, Wallow's Music at Gmail that we were operating <laughs> out of. Um, I think our manager actually is the one who emailed Austin about us first. Right? Oh, really? really? Right, Andrew? I thought it was the day after we put up plea or something. He, he told me about Oh, he, he told you about us. There you go. Interesting. Um, huh. Is that a SoundCloud? Did he discover you through SoundCloud? How did he find you early on? Uh, probably just because Pleaser, right? Spotify or whatever. Spot, like, cause, yeah. It was like number two on the US. Because it went viral, viral at that point, right? Yeah. yeah. We put out one song and then the next morning we woke up to like, an email from Austin, I think. Yeah. That's not normal, by the way. No, you it's not. You have to like slug it out of the clubs for three years, but... I mean, I like, know. we, we I mean, knew that did. from doing it for yeah. like a decade before, you know, whatever. But we, ne we never actually released music, but very yeah. good we didn't. Um, <laughs> yeah. Or we did actually. Well, technically. We, we technically did, but not, not on like Spotify or Apple Music or anything like that. We never had a band like The Fever or anything on that, right? I, I don't know. The narwhals, I think, made it on there. Jeez. But we then we took, took it, it down. down. Like, took made, it down. like, literally, it's like TuneCore expired or something. I mean, it's funny. Like people do, I mean, it's it's funny. Like, we were playing in clubs for 10 years before Austin reached out to us. And funnily enough, our first album, Nothing Happens, it was called that because every year we were like, is something ever going to happen with this band? <laughs> so then we said when we were 15, 16, no matter what, our first album has to be called Nothing well, Happens because it feels like nothing happens with the band, like, all the time. So we stuck to that. That was Dylan's idea. And, um, but yeah, it always, it, there's like that shift. You never, I remember when we were kids, we're like, how do these bands, how do they do it? How do you, how, how does anything happen? But it's, uh, it's interesting. What was it scene like in LA at that point when we were starting out? Was there like a Silver Lake scene? Because I remember there was a lot of bands bubbling under from that scene too. Mm. Like in Wall, like at the beginning of Wallows? Yeah, I mean, you were mm. young, but obviously there was a scene in LA. There's always been a, a music mm -hmm. scene and a vibrant scene in LA. Do you remember the bands around you at that time when you were starting to play out? <clears throat> sort of. I feel like um, we never, like, maybe not never, but I think that we sort of um, weren't so involved in a scene. Like, for some reason, I feel like we were kind of, like, like separate from all. Do, like, yeah, because we, um, at the time, we would rehearse always out in Santa Clarita. So mm -hmm. we were, like, driving out there. Like, I lived in the Valley. You were in Granada Hills. Like, we kind of... Um, like I didn't even know what Silver Lake really was because like I didn't yeah, know. I still like, don't know what it is. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like it's, that's funny. Yeah, I wasn't like we weren't involved in like what maybe was like cool and at the time. Like there's obviously bands from from LA. There's an LA sound or whatever. I'm sure you could go back to that time. But um, yeah, I don't think we always played with like the same local bands, like the local Santa Clarita. Like it was very like um, wholesome and it's like it's its own weird thing, right? Yeah, I think around that time, like I remember, it, like <clears throat> Slow Hollows was definitely one. Okay, around yeah, because th there was the smell, but yeah. I don't know if we ever played at the smell. No, no, we never played the smell. Yeah, that was in Silver Lake. I think it was downtown. Downtown, downtown. downtown. Oh, right? Mm -hmm. I think it's still there because it was going to close and then it didn't. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's hard to remember, but no, we were because we were never. Yeah, we were never part of it. And at a certain point, you get the Warp Tour, which is amazing, right? How did that feel, like, such a young age to be playing that festival? How did it be incredible? It's one of the funniest things to ever happen in the history of life. <laughs> um, it was one Because show. you were so young. Because we were so young. Yeah, yeah, we only played one show on Warp Tour. And I remember we, we played it because we won this 98-7 Battle of the Bands when we were, like, 14. So one of the prizes was to play Warp Tour. One of the funniest days ever because we were so... Like, you know, when you're that young, you have this vision, like, wow, you're going to play the main stage. It's going to be 100,000 people. Was it like the 10 a.m. slot? What, what it slot was in was the it? back of a semi-truck. <laughs> <laughs> in a truck. In a truck. Right. And there was like... They don't advertise that. No one no. there. and it, But it was still awesome. Yeah. And uh, I remember my guitar was so out of tune. There's a video of it. It's like... down and down and down and down. Like, it was so out of tune. It was so funny. Uh, but the other songs were, were pretty cool. Like that, it was only out of tune for a second. That's, that's nearly second. 15 years ago at this point. <laughs> yeah. Who was yeah. the headliner at that point? Was it like Blink or something? Like Simple or? Plan, maybe. Okay. Simple Plan. Oh, yeah. Simple Plan. Back when Simple Plan I think 303 was, like was playing at the same time as us. 303. Wow. wow. It's funny because you probably get that call. You're like, we made it. We're playing the Warp Tour. And nobody tells you on the back of a truck. Yeah. Right? They like open so, up the thing. You're like, <laughs> yeah. It was so funny. But you know, for us, we were stoked. Oh, yeah. We, we were so yeah. Um His name, the guy who, Kevin Lyman. The sure. guy who started, started Warped Tour. Oh, he, yeah. Warped yeah, Tour, yeah, yeah. He 
came to our set. Do you remember that? Oh, he did. So he was there oh, at our I, set, I, wow. which I'm always like, man, I really respect him for that. And then fast forward to when I was in school, I ended up in his music festivals class. Amazing. And I was like, yeah, we played Warp Tour like, you know, whatever, 10 or whatever many years ago. And he's like, oh, yeah, yeah. Super nice guy. Yeah. Super nice dude. It's cool. Talk to me about the second record and leading up to that, because obviously that was a pivotal moment for you, I think, right? We definitely had attention on our first record for us, especially like, because we, we put out singles and the, those gained traction and we put out an EP. Yeah, I don't know if... if uh, well, maybe yeah. more momentum for you for the second record, I guess, right? The fan base was growing, rabid fans. Obviously, people were really into the band. Yeah, this I one, think, you're playing MSG in the form, so <laughs> yeah, obviously right. it's really happening for you. So. I think that's uh, a result of what happened over COVID, which was one of our songs, Are You Bored Yet?, from the first album, really started to like pick up on TikTok, and I think that really helped boost things for us. Um, so yeah, there's definitely more attention and like listeners going into the second album. Um, How do you feel about the fact that all music is broke through TikTok these days, right? Because people have such short attention spans and they listen to songs for like 10 seconds. When you're creating music, you're not like, this body work, I just want people to listen to for the first 20 seconds, right? Mm -hmm. So do you have like a love-hate relationship with that and the sense of social media and, and breaking music? Because you really need to break music through that these days. It's kind of a big part of the story. Mm -hmm. It's love-hate for sure, I think. What were you gonna say? Yeah, no, I was gonna say I feel like um, we started the band like right before TikTok was a big thing, though, right? Like technically speaking, like we started Wallace before TikTok was mm -hmm. the way to make things happen in yeah. some sense. Like in 2019, I don't think we were really like acutely aware of how impactful it was gonna be. Like it, it kind of felt like um, it felt kind of like a novel or something. Like it didn't right. like it wasn't like um, I didn't take TikTok seriously at that point. Right, like, like how we do now like I, I think I, I feel lucky um, to have such like devoted fans that like actually care about like the bodies of work like the songs that they'll request at shows are so deep cut from the album like last song on our first album or whatever and um, so I feel like I'm happy that the majority of the people that listen to our music it is like a, there's like a they have a love for the the whole project versus just like known for one specific thing. To, I mean, I, I think I think it's great though that you could be discovered through TikTok. Like, I mean, I'm sure. I mean, I don't know what you think about it, but no, it's love for, uh, for everything he just said. But then, but then, and it's it's annoying when you have to go like listen to a new song of yours that you love and go, what's the catchiest part? You know, like what's the line that could make? And I don't know how that shit works. Like you have no idea. Well, but, you're not um, thinking about that when you're creating music. No, you're just no. creating to create, yeah. right? No, but then, but then there's something like really special about TikTok in the sense that there's so many, like so many songs catch on that otherwise never would have. Like, let's just give Surf Curse as an example. That band, like that song Freaks, we've known that song forever. And now it's like a over a billion streams hit because people found it on TikTok and like it. So I think it's it's really, it's a useful tool for like artists to get, um, uh, to get discovered, like even like us. So I could never hate on what TikTok does for artists. I think it's actually really cool, but it's the, it's the sound bite, the, the rapid consumption of it. That's like the struggle sometimes for yeah. sure, which I think any artist would also like, I think it's kind of like a joint it's great, but also it sucks. Kind yeah. Of thing. Are there any songs of yours that you didn't think that would go viral on there that did, and it surprised you? Like a song from the first record, Margarita Taco. Yeah. <laughs> could be anything. It's already bored yet. I mean, that one. I think even from the get go. I mean, it's our biggest song, but um, it was on our first album, and we even for a moment like we're debating it even going on the record. And I think like we really liked that song, but and but we weren't hearing it as like a single. I remember Craig was like, that's the lead single. I remember being like, what are you talking about? That doesn't make any sense. Yeah. And, but he heard it and uh, he heard whatever it had. And that's why they pay him the big bucks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so. Um, but yeah, I think uh, that it surprised us from the get go that that was even like gonna be the lead single from our first album. And yes, it had Claro and like we knew it was gonna be released. We just didn't know what its place in the record was. We didn't know, we didn't have uh, expectations for that song. And now it's like, um, it's gone very well. So. Uh, after that, I decided to be like, I'm gonna let go of what I think singles are because I don't. It's it's one of the songs I would have picked as a lead single is like probably one of the lesser stream songs in the album or something, for example. So 
Yeah, what was it like? Yeah. I think you worked with Roger Manning on the second record, one of my favorite keyboard players of all time, and, and a band called Jellyfish, which a lot of people don't know is one of the greatest bands of all time, underrated mm. for sure. How'd you, did you, how'd you guys meet Roger? How'd that come about? Gosh, I mean, I feel like Ariel in that case is sort of like... Ariel, who produced the record. Yeah, Ariel yes. Regshed, who's yeah. um, one of the goats. Um, he is sort of the like epicenter of a lot of like really cool, like just he like has an impressive, I'm sure, contact list of like cool musicians and stuff. So it was his idea to bring Roger in because I don't think we had ever like heard of him. Mm -hmm. What's funny though is we play this like, um, he did some Jackbox music, right? Do you remember that? Like synth stuff? Did he? I don't think he did. You don't think he did? No. Am I tripping? I think you're tripping. Okay. <laughs> yep. Cut that. Well, a lot of Jellyfish's music has that quality. It almost sounds like circus music, so that would make sense if, right. if he did. Right, right, so, yeah. yeah. Anyways. Um, when <laughs> you can't even mix up that I thought the sound on the song sounded like Jackbox music. <laughs> I, I think he did he compose did. for one of the games. Maybe, oh, then, not, maybe not Fibbage, but I think he did right. like Break the Internet, one of the other ones. Whoa, cool. But... I don't know. We'll we'll check that later. Yeah. I'm not sure if Do I'm a little fact check. Yeah, yeah. But um he's great. I mean, it's it's funny to see someone come in who just has such an expansive knowledge of synthesizers cuz like for for us um like playing synths and stuff is fun and like we can like turn the knobs and open the filter or whatever and like kind of like understand oh like this sounds good or like our producer helps or whatever, but um his knowledge is just like just like Insane. Like I'm I'm sure that you could just talk to him for so many hours, hours about yeah. all kinds of just crazy like gear and like things. So um have you ever gone back and listened to Jellyfish? Actually, no. no. I no. no. You gotta check them out. One of the greatest bands of all time. Amazing. And it's Robert's wow. band. Oh, that's so oh, cool. I, I, I can't wait. Yeah. yeah, so cool. So the second record starts hitting for you and you work with the main I guess Aaron was like a game changer for you in a sense, right? Because I feel like I think you had mentioned for you it was really kind of changed the whole way you created music and the production on the record was different for you than the first album? Yeah, I mean, I think I think John, if I just, I, I'd say John and Ariel were both game changers. Like, I think John introduced us to what making music is and gave us so much advice and gave us so much confidence in ourselves. Like, I think John, in that sense, is probably, like, the game changer of our recording careers, technically. And then Ariel is... An expansion of that and he probably he was really he was so great at um making every song a blank canvas changing it like turning it on its head like we'd bring in a song that was like a fully written guitar song and then it ended up like a string ballad or something and it's like how does he just has this mind that can just transform a song right before your eyes and um i think that album our second album has a very very much like a every song from the next is just completely different like it, it's really it's really incredible. Yeah. So they were both game changers for different reasons, I'd say, for sure. Definitely. I, but I think Brain's right that, like, John Congleton, uh, we did our first EP with him as well. He's the first, per, like, he's the first, like, working, like, I, I don't know how to, he's, like, the first person that had been doing, like, make, made records that we listened to growing up. First person we ever worked with like that. And um, he, he really was, like, pivotal because he did our first EP, the Spring EP, and Nothing Happens. And I remember we got an email from him after doing Spring, before Nothing Happens. And he was just like expressing that we need to blow the Spring EP out of the water on all fronts. And like, and this really pa impassioned like email about how we need to tackle our debut album. And it was really inspiring. And we really went head on together with that. And um, yeah, and then, but yeah, but then Ariel helped expand even further in different ways. And then, and then, I don't know, we just sort of naturally found ourselves back with John again on this one. Um, yeah. Just given the, yeah, but that's, yeah, we found ourselves back with John. Well, you got a new record dropping tomorrow. By the time you listen to this, it'll be out for about a month. Model, tell me about the idea behind Model. It's about the idea of perfection in a sense, right? Kind of. Sort of, yeah. I mean, it's, um, I think that... I mean, the word model in itself is about... Uh, yeah, like a constructed yeah. thing. I mean, yeah, we... I think with this record, um, we went into it with the mindset of, like, let's try to make our most, like, light on its feet, kind of lean and mean record. Like, I think one reason is we sort of knew the, the tour we were going to embark on for the record prior to going into the studio for the first time, which, like it didn't like exactly change how we wrote or like didn't change how we 
um, a, it, it just changed how we like approached it big picture, I think. Um, and so, yeah, we wanted, we wanted it to do, to like belong in the rooms that we were going to, we knew we were going to, it was just going to happen in the future. Um, and yeah, model, I think this time every album process has been very different. And this one was like, okay, let's go in. Let's like not waste time. Let's not give ourselves time to overthink. Let's just try and, and like first idea, best idea, make a song, move on to the next one, go quickly. Um, What's that process like? You get in a room, you just hammer it out real time? Sort of, right? I mean, we, mm -hmm. we had a, a pretty big uh, folder of demos because we're always kind of writing and we had some stuff left over from various writing sessions that we did with um, producers and friends and, and so on. Um, and so we definitely had the foundation already kind of there of what we like wanted to do. Um, but yeah, we just went in and just were quickly making decisions with John, just like deciding on what a sound was going to be and, and going like going with it and um, performing the songs, drums, bass, guitar first to start and just like getting all the skeletons sort of lined up. Um, we ended up doing 25 songs in the two months. A lot of which, songs. It's almost like a double mm, record. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> it could have been if we wanted it to be yeah. easy. It's like way more than we've ever done Physical in the Physical graffiti past. or something. Right. Yeah, exactly. Right. Um, we really could have. Was yeah. there ever a point where you said, maybe there should be a double record or not really? That was never a thought. Because no, it's hard to dwindle it down. They're like your kids, right? You're like, I love all these songs. Yeah, there was a time where we were like, well, it's our third album and The Clash's third album was London Calling. That's right. 19. So and we're like, maybe we should have a 19 song album. Right. But John quickly. Not a good idea these days. Right. John quickly was like no that's a bad idea and we're like yeah no you're right you're right because it's good to just like focus on something and now I look at model and I'm like I this is the perfect track list like I really do think so even though we it left is. off some of our favorite songs but I th they'll be heard eventually for sure. compared to the previous records would you say this is more of an impulsive process with this record sort of yeah we, we I mean it was very instinctual we, we sort of like because we recorded so much in such little time in so little time that um uh we <laughs> my brain Turned off for a sec. Um, it's early. You know? Yeah, it's like <laughs> ten in the morning. We don't know what's going on. Yeah, um, what's going on? Wait, what was the question again? You said we. My brain just stopped. Impulsive. Yeah, it was an impulsive yes. record for you. Um, Sorry, we, I forgot we, too. So I guess <laughs> yeah, my brain's yeah. not working either. So. Because there's so much, we didn't allow ourselves to like. Uh, we didn't really have time to overthink anything. We'd approach a song. We we approach every song with just drums, bass, guitar out the gate, um, and then we'd like layer the bare minimum and track the bare minimum on top of it. But we'd start the just the bones, the skeleton of each song, like five at a time. And then we'd like move on to another so that we kept sort of giving each song like at least, at least a few days before hearing it again at a time. So it allowed us to just keep coming back and be like, this is cool. Oh yeah, this one's cool. And never be able to sit there all day and, and overthink and start to think that it's not cool. So it was, a, it just really was, yeah, very impulsive, instinctual, just, um, trust your gut process, I would say. Um, and we had a lot of different, like we really could have made two very different albums as well because there's one that could have been a lot more experimental and dark. Like the songs that are left over, it's like it could be a little bit darker, a little bit more experimental, a little bit more odd at times and like whatever, if we wanted to, but we're not gonna, no, there's not a second album. But we, I think we ended up really just choosing the ones that made the most sense together. And we that we thought, would be the right album for us to put out right now that doesn't feel like a repeat of any, either of the two that came before. And um, it's a I fantastic think, record, by the way, because I spent some time thank with you. it. Yeah. Oh, oh, thank and you. And I guess by the time you listen to this, everybody will have a month to listen to it. So great, great record. Do you have favorites on the record? Certain songs that you're like obsessed with and want to play live? And <laughs> We were just talking about this. I feel like it's it's the first time that we feel like we want to play every song in the album live. Which you can't, really, because it's hard to put together a yes, set list. Exactly. Now you got three or four. We're you know, debating, yeah. Right, so. Yeah, we have to choose which ones to leave off. But I feel like um, Only Ecstasy is one of my favorite songs in the album. Um, I'm really excited for that one. And a song called Canada I think is really unique for us. And I, I really like how that one turned out. Um, Anytime Always I really enjoy. Can't wait to play that one live. I don't know about you guys. Yeah, and the, like, the good thing about this is that this is the first time we're putting out an album with like two months before we tour it. Normally we put out an album and tour immediately. So what will help us make the decision is how the fans have... Reacted, reacted to the album yeah. then. So we'll learn every song and we're just going to like see what happens and see what we play. But Let's I'll, talk about that for a moment because yeah. you're playing the Bowery tonight again by the time you listen to this you have already played there. Mm -hmm. But you're also playing amazing venues like Madison Square Garden. Did you ever think that you'd be playing Madison Square Garden? 
Think? No. Hope? Yes. Yeah. But it's just, <laughs> yeah. it's like the pinnacle, right? That and the forum. So it's one of those yeah. things that like, and people say that rock music is dead in a sense, but it's not because live, and look at your fans, right? Look at the fan base. So, I mean, it's got to be incredibly exciting and such a pinch me moment, I would imagine, when you think about, of course, tonight is a great venue, the Bowery Ballroom, mm-hmm. but but I think in August you're playing Madison Square Garden. So that's got to be something like, <clears throat> again, you dream of, but you know, not everybody gets to do that. Yeah. I don't think I really understood that until um, we did some uh, like press stuff a few months ago here and got invited to a Knicks game at at Madison and you're Square like, Garden. I'm actually playing here. Yeah, yeah. we were. <laughs> I was sitting in there. I'm like, it goes back so far. Like you don't really like. We've never really um, played any sort of arena or anything. Like the biggest venue we ever played prior to this tour was opening for Vampire Weekend at Alley Pally in right. London, which right. is like just like a 10,000 cap. It's just like a big rectangle basically. But then you played there yourselves too. We are we are playing yeah. there, which is hilarious. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like being being in that room, because I had never been at that point to MSG. I was like, oh my God, like there's people like, uh, like I'm like, there's people up there. Behind like, the stage everywhere. It's yeah, for me, it's, it's not about how far back it goes. It's how uh, like you're there and you're like, People are sitting up in there. <laughs> yeah. so like that's ins- yeah. Do you get nervous for a show like that or a show like at the Forum, your hometown? You got to get a little nervous, right? Lollapalooza, any of the Coachella. Do those shows make you nervous or are you just excited? It's both. It's both, yeah. Yeah. We played a little acoustic show in London. We were just there a couple of days ago, and um, I got nervous, like a little yeah. fun nerve, like fun nerves. It's like excitement nerves, yeah. you know? Like, I'm happy we're not just, uh, all right, let's go on stage. Let's play. Like, you get that, like, oh, here we go. Okay, yeah. so then um, it's going to be fun to see what MSG feels like yeah. walking out there. My, uh, <laughs> sorry, my uh, my girlfriend is a director, and she, she does work for Vogue and had to do um, an Usher video, like, ahead of his Super Bowl performance, like, an interview with, like, his costume sure. or, or his costume his outfit <laughs> um and uh she asked like they asked him something like oh does does is, are you going to be nervous doing this like you're on the super bowl yeah. and he's like his response was pressure makes diamonds mm. okay and i thought that was so there you go pretty pressure cool makes diamonds. there we go i like pressure that. makes diamonds Maybe that's why i read all my lyrics the very last second <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> tell me like a couple of the songs on the record like bad dream i think it was kind mm. of inspired by like a boy an attempt to write like a boy band song in a way right that's correct we were Cole and I were writing that day because uh, Dylan was away, and um, I was listening to a lot of NSYNC just because I I was just like I just love the melodies and I love that whole good songs. They're right? great I songs. Mean, you don't kind of yeah. want to admit it. It's almost like a guilty pleasure. Like I right. don't tell people I like them, but they do have great songs. They're great because I just <laughs> love the just the flow of all the melodies. They could all be a chorus in a sense. You know, they're all the verse to the to the pre to the this. Like it's all this like perfectly constructed journey, which is like cool like you know max martin being one of those songwriters or producers that are so great and um we were do you know the guy rick knowles i don't he uh he wrote um he's written so many iconic songs like um i know max martin max Max martin Martin, yeah Yeah, rick knowles um he wrote like heaven is a place on earth um he wrote with the new radicals guy you only get what you give yeah yeah another great underrated band yeah Yeah. and then like more recently he'd worked with Lana Del Rey and like some yeah (laughs) right like Young and Beautiful I think was one of them I think so yeah anyway we 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 went in to just like record some stuff with him like he wanted to just record with us so we I remember his process was make a song title then let's write a song and then I I went in with a bunch of joking titles like just the dumbest titles you've ever heard for fun I was like the key to love and super much like just dumb titles and one was bad dream because I thought that sounded funny um because I think Cole and I were kind of tired and we were just like okay let's just go make a song so on his wall was in sync plaques because he wrote with in sync and I was like oh that's cool we should like write a song like that so I just started strumming <laughs> the chords and started singing the melody and then Cole and I just like went into the back room and just wrote the song and then um we recorded it and I was like, oh, this is funny. Like we were kind of like, not joking, but we kind of were. But then we listened to it back and we're like, wait, this is actually kind of good. Well, we should make it. Well, that's the thing. Yeah, I wasn't there, but I, it, the first demo was really like dramatic and more like <laughs> it was. boy bandy. Like it was, it, it was funny. It was, <laughs> but remember they sent it to us as like, LOL, whatever. Like this is a joke kind of. And I remember I, I not really, but like they sort of forgot about it. And I think cause I wasn't there had like, 
an unbiased opinion of it. So I remember like I was trying to convince them. I was like, guys, this song's good. Like, yeah. this is, like, cool. <laughs> we were in the parking lot of Bob's Big Boy. Yeah. It was uh, the counter. Oh, it was the counter. <laughs> oh, it was the counter. <laughs> it was the okay. counter. Okay. But I remember I was, I was in the car and I was listening to it. Then I was like, guys, this is like, I'm at, I, I remember saying, imagine Arctic Monkeys doing this and then, then try to think of this song. And then I think that's when they're like, oh yeah. And I remember being like, guys, it's good. I'm telling you, like I have nothing to do with it and it's good. It's and, one of my uh, favorite tracks on the record. So it's, oh, a, it's a great track. We've tried for years sort of to get it right, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, and it's not even like this version is like the one finally. It's just we finally sort of like let go of trying to make it something that it's not. We yeah. just sort of like let it be what it... This this version is like how the song should just feel. Just feel, yeah. Well, you guys have been together over 10 years. Has your dynamic changed as a band? Obviously, it's still great friends. We were chatting about that, but... If you think about bands that have been together since they were like nine and ten years old, it's a lot of time. Yeah, and you could hate each other. Yeah, but do you think your dynamic has changed a lot over the years? I think, if anything, that the trust in ourselves has, has grown tremendously. Like, um, I write a song and I want to hear what they don't like about it. If that makes sense, like I'm, I'm not looking for the that's so great, that's amazing. I'm looking for like what would you change about this? Like, I really do feel like Wallow songs are just like the mind meld of all three of us. Like. All the songs wouldn't exist without the three of us. And I think the biggest change in the band that we've been saying is like about a year into the band and prior, like before Wallows existed up to Springy Peace, our first couple singles, whatever, Dylan and I wrote the songs. Like, you know, Cole didn't really play guitar, like he was a drummer or whatever. But then he started playing guitar, keyboard, and then Cole started writing songs and they were really good. I mean, he wrote Are You Bored Yet, for example. So there you go. Uh, and, um, that has been the biggest thing because now from 2019 on, we've just been equal songwriters and we all bring ideas to the table and we all contribute to every single song. So now Wallows is quite literally just the three of us writing music, which is which is great. That's been my favorite change that I wouldn't have predicted in you know, 2011 or something, which is cool. Dylan, we didn't even talk about the fact that 13 Reasons Why was a massive show that you were on years ago. And I know a bunch of people that work with you on the show, Ross Butler and Devin, but is it hard to balance that life at some point, like acting? I'm sure early on when you started to tell your agents and managers, I got this band and they're probably like, yeah, 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 keep concentrating <laughs> on the acting, right? Or were they encouraging you? Because I think a lot of acting managers, the first they think about is like, not let me let one of my artists go ahead and yeah, play I music think, and be I on the road for, for them, five it was years. like hard to, not to cut you off, sorry. Yeah, yeah. I think for them, it's like, yeah, it was hard to understand. It definitely was like, Haha, ha, yeah, that's nice, you know. Um, right. But that's why I think when Have like fun. when okay. Wallow started like just really speaking for itself and doing well, I remember feeling like now people can understand, you know, like I that I always knew this would this could be a real thing because um, we've done this forever and I always be we always believed in ourselves. and I'm happy we didn't stop. Um, I mean, at first, yeah, when I was on that show, it was like seven months of shooting and then it was I was devoting five months to Wallows. Like it was then then I like I could have acted between the thing, the between the seasons and I was like, nope, I really Wallows is I I have to do this. I want to. And by the time the show was over, I sort of felt this freedom because Wallows was doing so well by the time it was was over. Um I felt this freedom to just put all of my time and energy into Wallows, which I wanted to do for a while. I mean like I loved my experience on that show, but it was definitely like so much work and I feel like acting started to feel more like a job than anything and I was like I'm in a very fortunate position to be able to like pivot and put all my time to do another job that just feels like a passion right now and um and so for the last few years that we've all just been like all walls all the time do you think you'll be going back into acting or is this it for this point in your life it's just like all music which I'm say? sure I'll act again at yeah. some point it's just like this is happening right now. Yeah, you know? no question. Yeah. Well, talk to me about a couple of things. I know recently, I think you did shrooms and maybe uh, <laughs> maybe some Madonna at the forum. Yeah. How did that prepare you for these shows coming up? Shrooms at Madonna. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it definitely because that's a great story. That was, I mean, it was, that was like it was just a gummy, so it wasn't insane. It was. Just I like sort shrooms, of like, by the way. So no judgment. No, I mean, I don't think they're like. I the think things, everyone yeah. should try them in their lifetime. <laughs> honestly, um, I think. Uh, I mean, honestly, more so than my first true shroom experience was the day before we started recording this album. The day That's before. Right. I remember I came in, we walked into this empty room, hadn't even set up the gear yet. And I was like, guys, I had the I had the best day of my entire life yesterday. It doesn't feel like drugs. It just feels like you're Oh like no, no, it elevated. doesn't. It it really just feels like it, I mean, it feels like the truth or something. Like you're, <laughs> when you're in it, you're like, 
I, it, it's, uh, it's, it's a visceral, like unbelievable experience. Um, but that I think more so than anything, it like inspired me in the recording process rather than a gummy at Madonna. It didn't really make me think about the show. <laughs> so I don't really have a story there. <laughs> I think that, uh, it opened up your mind for the, the record. If anything, nice. it just made me go like, we're, it was just the thing of like, we're playing in here. That's really crazy. Yeah. Um, you know, where it's like, yeah, but I think it just inspired, it really inspired me because I remember I had all these, I was, I did it with my girlfriend and I was having all these really, I just felt like I was the best version of myself in all fronts. And I remember thinking like, I was saying all these really poetic and beautiful things. My jokes were hitting. <laughs> I was like, this is And they is don't the hit best. when you're not on motion. Absolutely not. <laughs> right. um, but I, uh, yeah, it, just, it, it gave me a lot of inspiration going into, um, the recording into the studio and and honestly it really shaped the lyrics of only ecstasy i mean like the majority of the lyrics in the song only ecstasy came from thought things i was saying when i was on shrooms um to my girlfriend and that's like uh that song is the last song in the album it's like very much so and like a very blissful just love song it's that's just what it is um and i remember i sang the lyrics in the booth and i came out and john he was like very, he was very like cynical and it's like, you know, it's hard to write a good love song and it's yeah. true. I mean, I always struggle, always struggle with yeah. it. Um, and then I came out and he was like, congratulations, you wrote a great love song. And I was like, that's awesome. But it just came from, I mean, honestly, it came from uh, a lot of like my feelings when I was on trips. And I hate to say it, but I feel like artists write better songs when they experiment a little bit. If you think about like the White Album and a lot of those early Beatles records, they were all into all kinds of stuff, right? And, it makes and, so much more sense. Yeah. When you do it, you're like, oh my God, it makes so much sense <laughs> yeah. why it is the way it yeah. is. Yeah, and, and also like, yeah, whatever. Gonna, well, that's another podcast. We'll do that another time. <laughs> <laughs> Besides you guys, I know you're huge fans of the Strokes as an example. Like who is your favorite new exciting artist that you really look up to these days? Mm. I love wow. Always. The band Always is like my favorite current band, I'd say. Dylan? I'll just go for it. There's a lot that inspires me right now, but the first thing that comes to mind is Adrian Linker and Big Thief. Either sure. or both. Mm -hmm. Like, just, I think no songs are really affecting me in the same way that when I hear any of her songs or their songs, to be honest. I love the fact that you have like notes on your phone and you like color code all these records. Is it true that you got a color code all these records you're listening to? I do. Yeah. Yeah. Is I, that just because you're like OCD or you're like, I just no. need to know what's going on with the music I'm <laughs> listening to? Like, I, I don't know. I like, I think I really like, I like lists and I like. We'll, we'll do some in a minute. Oh, I love there it. You go. And I like <laughs> album lists. Yeah. Like we've been talking all about the Apple Music, 100 yeah. Best Albums list. Yeah, I love fun. all that so stuff. Fun. So it's like for me, it's able to, I'm able to look at it in a list form and keep track of like these are my favorites of the year, or I, I didn't like these albums or whatever, but yeah, I don't yeah. know. What about you, Cole? Um, Gosh, I think we, we've been really into the band Chanel Beads. Oh yeah. Like we go on and on about how inspiring that record is, like production-wise, and I think it's cool because they're a band that, um, or a group, or I don't even really know what they would like to be called, but um, their, their songs and melodies sound so much like them, which I think is so cool. Like they're doing something where I'm like, it's like, it's like becoming like a their thing and it's like recognizable. Yeah. It's and immediately their own. It's it's their own, yeah, which um I think is really cool. And that record is so good. Awesome. Well it's early in the morning, so I'm gonna take a shot. You guys want a shot with me? This I love is so. mental clarity. I've been waiting. It's yes. Magic mind. Magic mind. Uh, I mean I can't really think because it's like ten AM. <laughs> yeah. So from for clarity and mental clarity, okay. magic mind. Here you go. Cheers. 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 You know, we don't do mushrooms, we just do magic mind. Mm -hmm. mm. Now we're gonna get into this top five. Ooh. Oh, that's Which, good. Uh, it is good, right? That's very good. I yeah. needed that. Are you supposed to, to have three? Delicious. Or you're supposed to have one uh, I mean, one. Yeah, I mean, has three. Yeah, have three. Three really? is great. Yeah. <laughs> you you can have two. You can have three. I'm going to save it. I'm going to save it. Parting gifts. Yeah. Take one with you. Wow. Sweet. I'll save it too. Yeah. Yummy. Go to magicmind.com and use the code LIPS. That's L I P P S. Go to magicmind.com, use the code LIPS, and check out the link in the description below. Um, at the end of the show, we do this great top five list that people <sighs> kind of debate. And uh, there's a bunch we want to go over. You guys are foodies, I guess, right? In a sense. Okay. Don't call it foodies. In a sense, I yeah. saw you did like Snack Wars in one of those videos. So. Correct. Right. We did. So I would love to ask you your top five LA restaurants. Oh, man. <sighs> Starting with Dylan, number five. Okay. Number five. Yeah. Are we going in order? Oh. No, we kind of go from five to one. Oh, shit. Okay. Whoa. Yeah. We prepped you ahead of time. But yes, you know, you we're just hard to do this real time, too. <laughs> we're we're, we're, yeah, we're we always cook. proponents of, of well, I feel like Los see. Angeles isn't spoken enough as like a, 
a food city. Food like culture. New York is, and it's understood because it is. But like, no one's ever like LA food. But we live there. In LA, there is good like, food in LA. I just yeah. I just moved back from there. Yeah, I lived there it's for the years. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We have some of the best stuff there. Sushi for sure. Oh, and, yeah. and Mexican. Okay, food. so sushi. Yeah. Maybe yeah. maybe number five. Oh man, sushi. I'm gonna go sushi. like sushi again, which is uh, in Little there. Tokyo downtown slash sushi park. Like sushi park's great. They're different, very different. One's omakase, yeah. one's just like sit at the counter and you, you order piece by piece. Both incredible. I yeah. just put that there. That's number five. That's great. Who wants to take number four? Oh my god. I think Cole's going for number four. Cole, you want to go for number four? Because I'm trying to think of what restaurants we want to say. You know what I mean? Like in and then like how to put them in an order because it's so hard. It is. Well, it's it's your list. So yeah, whatever yeah, yeah. people think and debate for hours, it's okay. still yep. your own list. Yep. So we just, were talking you know. about this, and I don't want to steal this from you because I feel like that you cooked up this idea, but it's just it's like what came to mind. You you know what I'm gonna say. Yeah. It, right now it's my number one, but just as like a Anyway, yeah, in perfect. terms of, yeah, I think there's reasons it could be number one, I think, to us. But we'll just put it at number four because it's sure. on my mind. The restaurant Pine and Crane. Um, they have two Silver restaurants. Silver Lake, right? Silver Lake. Yeah. And downtown now. Yeah, And downtown. Um, and then they have Joy and Highland Park. But we'll go Pine and Crane. Um, I just think for the money and the quality of food, it's really hard to beat. Because oh, it's, it's, it's not like you're going there and you're dropping like $40 on a meal that's like fan- or whatever. It's like, it's as good as fancy food, but you can get away with spending 12, 15 bucks and having like a good meal, um, which is actually so cool. This actually goes back because every single time that I've, which is not a a crazy amount of times, every time I've done shrooms, I always end the day (laughs) with ordering Joy or Pine and Crane. And every time it's like the best meal of my entire life. I'm like, it's like this, it's it's food for my soul. It's like become my favorite restaurant. It's actually park in literally make you bankrupt. I mean, it's like, you <laughs> it's know, crazy. $600 yeah, it's, for it's two not, people, whatever it is. So. You can't just casually right. I mean, you there. can, but you could also be It's a special right. experience. Yeah. 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 special experience. It's, yeah, Pine and Crane really feels like they cooked the food. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like you eat it and you're like, someone cared about making yeah. me this food right now, which is, it's cool. Yeah. So yeah. Let's take a crack at number three. I'll say all time. Right, right, oh, right. 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 All time's uh, great. Uh, mm-hmm. Yes, all time's great. I think the food is great. I love the atmosphere, like just going there to just like relax and have a good time. It's like half indoors, half outdoors. It's one of my favorite breakfast burritos. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll say all time's a great place to check out. Yeah, the breakfast, breakfast slash lunch and dinner is so good there. I so there, good. It was a great spot. We're yeah. on the last two, top Got two. It. Oh no. Dylan, I feel like you have something to say. No, here. I mean, I'm just going to, like, I know that if I watch this back, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be thinking about me, like, no, that's not my time. I'm going to regret it. So, you what know, is it like? There's like Hippo, Republic, like all those, or no? Republic's great. Republic's great. Yeah. Um, I, don't I do love influence. Hippo in Highland Park. Let's just go with Hippo right Hippo now. Hippo okay. That's a great. I mean, for me, it's like, it's probably not number two, but I do love that spot, yeah. but I don't want to waste our time, so I'm just going <laughs> to yeah. claim it. You claim number one, Cole. For the number one spot. Oh, my God. Let me think. I'd say In and Out, but Cole, what do you got? Oh, shit. I mean, it's not, that's no, not LA. I mean, that, that's no, like, no, no, yeah. that's like number one for oh, me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's separate. That's its own, that's its, that's own, its own piece of art. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Oh my gosh. The number one restaurant in LA. <sighs> oh my God. I, I, love Gold, I also love Goldberger. I love it. It's a great. Yeah, I love, I love Bestia and Safi's and, and, um, Bestia's and Bavel. Oh, yeah, Safi's those restaurants, great. Safi's yeah, one of my favorite. Those restaurants are so good. Yeah. So shout out. I think just what came to my mind because it's really nostalgic for me personally, and yeah. I think you guys have been here, mm-hmm. and it's Rip kind it. of changed over the years, but I love it. Is um, the restaurant Salsa and Beer in the Valley? I haven't been there. Um, like I just yeah, I I grew up down the street from the one in the Valley, and so like we would go all the time, and it's. Um, yeah, it's great. Like I remember like me and my friend growing up were really into paintballing. So we'd go paintballing and like when you do that, you're so tired and you have like bruises, you're like, oh, and then you go and spend like five ninety nine on the biggest like chicken burrito and like rice and beans <laughs> you've ever seen. Um, That's great. And it's just it's just awesome. Like I think that people in the valley it's like, um, it's an iconic like San Fernando Valley thing. Yeah, I don't know it, but I'm going to check it out now. It's great. Yeah, it's, it's a great number of, one. Yeah, it's changed over the years kind of because it's become really, really popular and like they expanded to, with different locations and stuff. But um, at its core, I think it's still what it was. And the bean dip they give you at the beginning, like they serve you bean dip with chips. Amazing. And it's so good. Awesome. Yeah. There we go. And last but not least, your top five indie rock records of all time. I feel like I know one of them, but again, I'm going to reserve... <laughs> I won't. Uh, Should I go number anything? five? Yeah, go number sure. five. I'm going to say number five is Room on Fire by The Strokes. Because I was going to say, is it's it, but Room on Fire. I'm going to go Room on Fire. Okay. I'm going to switch it up. I'm a Room on Fire guy. Yeah. I think, I think we all kind of are on that page. Yeah. 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 I think room it's the best. Fire. 
I had Albert on the show, and he listed his top five favorite stroke songs, and people were debating them for like I think they're still debating oh, them on my TikTok. his favorite wow. stroke. His, Do you remember yeah. like some of them? I'm I gotta go back and look because oh, they were cool. kind of obscure ones. They were like ones that I think he just wanted to be like weird, and <laughs> weird strange, yeah. strange ones. But uh, yeah, I'm gonna say Room on Fire. Dylan, what do you got? Number four. Man, that's hard. I think um, it might be even higher for me, but like I'm just gonna say Yankee Hotel Foxtrot. Um, I mean, that's one of my <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's in my it's in my top ten. And, awesome, um, Call, You got a number three for us. Oh my gosh, I'm gonna have to cook this one up for a second. Let him cook. Yeah, or we can go back with you if you guys want to take number I, three. I have one. Okay, okay yeah, let's go. go. I'm gonna say uh, the self titled Libertines album, the Libertines, oh, their second record. album. Yeah, uh, one of my favorites. Huge inspiration for me. Um, Game changing album. Yeah, the self titled. They're playing again. Have you seen them lately? They're playing. Uh, I have Wolves. never seen the Libertines live, yeah. and I really want to. One of my all-time favorite bands. I saw them. I saw them I, once. Yeah, I'd yeah. love to see them. It's not the same anymore because like they're not on drugs, and it's kind of weird. Right. But like, yeah. you know, they were such fuck ups back in the I day. I'm but, happy uh, Pete's healthy. He's one of my favorite yeah. Yeah. humans ever. Definitely. So I'm happy he's, yeah. he's good. All right, number two. Okay, Cole, I, think I, I think I think I cooked up? something up. Okay, yeah. It's just because it's been. <laughs> <laughs> I've been I've been into this recently, and so numbers number two who knows whatever but um i'm gonna say in the airplane over the sea the neutral milk hotel record would you consider that an indie rock record yeah i would yeah right like folky kind of um yeah i just think it's uh like i was listening to this right before we went on this trip and um it just sounds it sounds uh like it could be made tomorrow in a sense and um the production is so cool and um i like that it's like they made this record it's like this opus and then they just kind of stopped like just, they just like were like oh, no, I'm, I'm good you know um, underrated band by the way oh yeah yeah i'd say I mean, underrated. I, yeah i feel like they're big in their world like in that in the what like i feel like blogs and stuff and people talk about them yeah. a lot um so they're like big in that sense but um yeah, I guess underrated in like a more big picture kind of way. But well, talk to me about the tour. It's coming up, and the gigs that you're really excited about. The forum, MSG, the video. I think comes out like today, maybe tomorrow. The video for you comes out tonight. It comes tonight. out, yeah. And again, yeah. this is going to come out in a couple of weeks, mm-hmm. but it's, and the record comes out tomorrow. Wait. So it's a very exciting time period. Should for we do us. the number one? India? Oh, we didn't do it. That was two. Oh, oh that was shit. two. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, my bad. Oh no, you're good. The, I was like, I feel number, like people might <laughs> yeah, be like, de- wait, where's number we one? We definitely want the number one. Okay, okay. The number Dylan, one indie rock record for y'all, Dylan. You're up. Part of me is like my gut's telling me Yankee Hotel. But um, I mean, like in my mind, it goes, it's like, well, if you go true indie, I feel like Arcade Fire Funeral really set the tone for a lot and for us. And then I think like, but then you have like Blue Album slash Pinkerton, if you're including that as indie. I know it's more alternative, but like, I feel like those are the ones that come to my mind. Yeah. I mean, I think for like wall, formative Wallows lore, maybe... Yep. I, yeah. Oh, you can say it, but no, I... No, no, you go off. It's I interesting think, because your phrasing on this record to me reminds yeah. me of Rivers Cuomo, so it's mm. interesting that you would say that. Oh, wow. Definitely. Yeah. You know what? I think, number one, I'm going to have to give it to... Those are those are honorable mentions, but I'm going to I'm gonna give it to, yeah, for what Foreign Wallace has made. The reason that I actually started making music, in, that I wanted to make music oh, in sweet. the first place, because yeah. I heard it and I was like, I need to do that. Yep. And change things for us was Ahashi Carpet, Kings of Leon. Yeah, amazing. I that agree. that album was like the thing that really was like that's the coolest thing I've ever I heard from your agree. kids. Yeah, <laughs> so I gotta go with that. I will tell you a weird story about Weezer. Two seconds. Rivers Cuomo came to see. I played with Courtney Love, and he came to one of our gigs one day. He did a two month vow of silence. So he came to the gig. He was it was during his vow of silence, and he couldn't speak. So mm. he, I mean, imagine coming to a concert, seeing your friends, and like you're just not talking. So he's backstage, and everyone's like, "Hi," and he just doesn't. And you're like, "Is something wrong with him?" Whoa. Kind of a weird thing. Think about how you got to be in that to like not speak to anyone for a month or two. I but, would weird, wow. weirdly love to do that. Yeah. And I'd love to do that. I couldn't do that. The like cause... blind retreat where you go and like put blindfold on for like four days or mm-hmm. something. And yeah. like don't sp- it, that sounds A pretty... month or two without talking? A yeah. month or two without I mean, talking. I, do, I mean, that couldn't be me, but. Wow. I'm going to start right now. I, I'm yapping all day. <laughs> <laughs> and the tour, but, but before we forget, right? The tour and the gigs that you're most excited about, the record, it's all happening for you this week, right? And the tour is coming up. Yeah, right now it's out in certain countries and we're looking at the reactions and it's crazy that it's become people's, it's become other people's now. It's, it's really, really wild. Um, we're really excited for the tour, man. I mean, uh, it's it's bigger than we've ever done. I think we're really trying to make sure that our fans who are used to coming to a lot of shows and smaller shows still feel like connected to us. I think that's our goal. And like, but also give them a show that is bigger for a reason and like feels like it belongs there and feels better than ever. Um, we're more inspired and excited to play this album live than ever, like we were saying earlier. And it just is a really exciting and inspired time for us. And um, 
think we're going to put out more music along the way as well, along the tour. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. we're just really excited. We've got like, we just feel very, not. I don't feel like we feel that nervous about anything. We just feel like comfortable, not a bad way, like comfortable in like a good way, in a way that this feels right and we're not overthinking it and just letting it all happen, I guess. It's a great record, so congrats. I'm Thank coming you. to MSG. So oh, fantastic. You won't be able to see me because I'll be behind the stage or something. But I'll oh, be right. <laughs> we'll see you backstage. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Well, part two coming up, guys, for sure. Thanks for coming on. It's a pleasure. Yeah, Thanks for having us. This is really yeah, fun. More sure. lists next time. For sure. Yes. We'll yeah, yeah. Sounds awesome. good. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.